Okay, I think we uh, have everybody on. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the fourth Legends and Fly Tying series. My name is Fred Dupre, and I'll be your host tonight and for the next five sessions in November and December. You can get our future dates on the FFI website under FFI Online Season 2. While you're on our website, it'd be a great time to either renew your membership or to join the FFI and the Fly Tying Group. Your dues to the FFI support the many excellent programs like this one. The prime benefit of this series is our Q&A session with the tire. If you wanna ask questions tonight, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your page. Tonight, uh, we're featuring, featuring Scott Sanchez. Scott started fly fishing and fly tying at the age of 12. Scott was the fishing manager at Jack Dennis Sports, wholesale manager at Dan Bailey's, tying flies commercially, fly consulting work for Dan Bailey and Solitude Flies, working at the Austin Angler, being the first Texas sales rep for Scott Rods and now at is the manager of JD High Country Outfitters. Scott has written many articles and sold photos to American and Japanese publications, and his photos have won regional and national awards. He wrote the fly tying column for American Angler. He also wrote the beginning, the, the first beginner saltwater fly tying book, Introduction to Saltwater Fly Tying, and a new generation of trout flies. His book, The Never Ending Stream, is about tires and flies that have influenced him. In 1994, he received the Peter Crosby Memorial Sportsman Award from the Jackson Hole One Fly. In 2007, he received the Arnold Gingrich Lifetime Achievement Award for the literature, uh, for literature from the Federation of Fly Fishers. And in 2010, he was a recip recipient of the Buzz Busick Award for his contributions to the world of fly tying. In 2014, Scott won the first FFI Iron Fly Contest. Considered, uh, and Scott has been featured guide on a number of national TV programs. He is also considered one of the most innovative fly tires in the world. Scott, um, let me get you on here. Uh, what are you going to tie for us tonight, Scott? We're going to tie a couple of my favorite flies to both fish and tie. And it's kind of interesting. We all have flies we like to tie and we all have flies we like to fish. But when it's combined, it's even better. The first fly I'm going to tie is called the one feather wet fly. It could be a caddis, could be a, a traditional wet fly for swinging, could be dead drifted for as an emerger. And the second fly will tie is a PFD merger, or in a PFD parachute, I should say. Kind of a neat little parachute that floats real well and uh, some variations on this. We've got a hundred fish at the one fly contest or durable fly that catches fish. So kind of get going here. Uh, we'll show you the flies. We'll kind of show you the recipes. Uh, Bear with me, answer questions, have fun. That's the most important thing. Happy Thanksgiving Eve, I guess. So the first fly, let me uh, switch cameras here so you can see. It's a one feather wet fly. Looks like your kind of traditional wet fly here. And kind of the fun thing with this fly is I actually use one feather for both the wing and the uh, hackle. When this fly first came out, I mean, it's been around since my Livingston, Montana days, is uh, Whiting had sent me some of the first batches of the white laced uh, black and black laced white soft hackles, which are cool looking feathers. Let me grab one. Uh, this is actually a batch of their, the first generation. I mean, just neat looking feathers. And it's trying to figure different ways to use them. I mean, a great like uh, caddis adult, caddis spinner basically is a uh, partridge caddis. We tie in a partridge feather, 
make a few loose wraps and pull up the wing. I thought this might be a cool way to tie a partridge caddis with a different look. And all special is these dyed colors are there. So I tried that, but after I pulled it up, it's like, this feather is too good to waste. I should use it for the hackle. So that's where it started. So I've been tying this fly for probably at least 20 years, some very different variations on it. You can tie a streamer, still had version of it, but a fun fly to tie. I'll switch back here and give you the recipe. Looking at way high tap here. Hope you can see that. That looks good, Scott. So basic, you can use whatever wet fly hook. I'm very non particular. The one important thing with fly tying, technique is much more important than color. If you don't have the right color, tie it anyway. Learn, learn the method first. If you can tie a blooming, blooming olive, you can tie a PMD. But yeah, switch material, substitute if you need to. We'll go back to uh, switching cameras here and we'll put a new hook in the vise and do the one feather wet fly. So typically this fly, I'm gonna tie from a 12 to a 16, you can tie 18s. And this hook is a competition style, I'm gonna 203. I mean, so you can use a variety of hooks, like a standard shank, long shank. Uh, you can tie these on dry fly hooks if you want more of an emerger type fly. Do some better living through chemicals. Grab my Wet and Wild or Sally Hansen and put a smear of glue here to help hold the thread. I'll use some Uni 8 Dot and Iron Gray. Let's lay a base layer of thread. And the glue on the base layer of thread, I think, is pretty critical to fly durability and not having your flies twist. Hey, Scott. Or base for the other materials. Hey, Scott. Yes. Could you uh, switch cameras back and someone asked for you to hold that pattern sheet up one more time. You bet. Okay. Come pull it up a little Good. bit. Pull it up a little bit. No, the other direction up. See. Oh, up. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay. I think that'll do it. And you can tie this with any sock hackle. I've tied it with grouse. I've shot, you know, I've tied it with sage grouse. And you can just, anything that's the right size will certainly work for this. So the first thing I'll do is tie in the rib. I'm a big fan of segmentation. Let's find uh, the crystal flash here. I just set down. If not, I'll reach behind me. You're you gonna can have to switch pearl, your camera. You can use peacock colored crystal flash. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you're, gonna it to, uh, you're gonna have to switch your camera back to the front. Switch back cameras back. Thanks for the reminder. Okay. I might be slow, but I'm stupid. No, no, no. Doing great. We got to do a little focus, focus here. Out of focus. out of focus. There you go. There we go. And since I look, I like drop the uh, peacock colored stuff. I'll just use some of this kind of pearlescent colored crystal flash. Oops. Let's capture that here. Better, easier said than done. Let's get this a little bit better here. That's a little bit sharper there. Yep, that's so good. Crystal flash for the rib. I'll use some dark all or peacock colored dubbing. I also tie this fly in, you know, standard caddis colors, tan, brown, dun, whatever natural colors. And this could also be like a, a betis emerger, which are pretty active swimmers. This is some old scintilla kind of antrony type dubbing. And this stuff from WAPS, either antron stuff works pretty well. The Senyo stuff. One trick with dubbing, 
use less than you think you need and then cut that in half. The other thing to do is just pinch the hell out of it. Now twist it one direction, kind of get in the winter season where I may need to lube my fingers a little bit. If I need to add more, add more. Hope you guys can see that there. Focus more on the fly than you are on my fingers. Maybe I never use dubbing wax because I hate wiping it off my fingers. The other reason I can actually slip this up to the tying point. It's going to be a little scraggly, which is your typical caddisy body, right? Whatever excess there, just break it off. And the other thing people have a hang up with is if I unwrap this, this flies look worse the second time, just snip off the loose fibers. You want just a hair of shag, but if it's too much, just use your scissors. And then the uh, flash, the crystal flash will also kind of smooth some of this stuff out. So let's rip it with the crystal flash. And I really like the way crystal flash shows the color underneath it. I think segmentation is one of the most important things on the imitation of bugs. All the bugs got little racing stripes on them, right? The crystal flash, flash plastic is a lot, pretty slippery. So a good way to try it off is twist it around your thread a few times and then come up. Let's just do that one more time. Twist the flash around your thread. It's not coming out that way. Got one more loose hair there. Use my scissors, kind of like a stiletto there. Now we're gonna get the feathers. You know, like a whiting Brahma hen, but it says you can have use partridge feathers, grouse feathers, a lot of other feathers. Now grab a feather. And one important thing with sizing feathers is if it's on the hide, do it while it's on the hide. Don't break it off first because you're going to lose the feather. And it's a wet fly, so you know even a shank length is okay on that. I might get one slightly smaller than that, but that's pretty close. We got a feather. Gonna bust off the fluff because that's just gonna get in my way and make me mad. A lot of fly times being cruel, the dead animate object, right? And the next thing I do is gonna prep the feather. I'll do this and I'll put it in front of you. I want this to be longer than the shank length, but I'm also gonna pull it up. So maybe at one and a half, one and three quarters, this part here will become the hackle. So let's come in here. I'll try to do this so we can see it. And this is a good way to hold materials on top of the hook. Just push it down with your finger. Make two or three loose wraps. If it's not on straight, it's not very tight in there, right? Now we're going to adjust the wing. So pull gently, and it will shorten the wing would also kind of pull the fibers together. So kind of that caddisy wet fly type wing. One thing that inadvertently happened with this fly, is this is a feather that's got a cup down side. And I should have said that before too, I have the convex side down. And the old the Kelly Gallup flies, like the Sue Cougar and stuff with the uh, quill wings, kind of that spoon effect by accident, this kind of has that kind of deal where it will kind of wobble. So let's finish securing that down and then let's pull. Let me grab a hackle plier so you don't, my hands aren't in the way. Pull it back with the curve facing towards, you know, backwards. And it just happens it's perfectly in there, right? And that's me wrapping a wet fly hackle. So let's kind of pre-fold it. Stroke the feather fibers back, right? And you may need to 
do that as you wrap. And I mean, that's what, three wraps? That's probably plenty. Okay, drop my bobbin over. Hold my thread away from my finger to make a snap. Now we can kind of pull the fibers back. Make a slight head. We got, and this is optional, but I like the way it looks. If you look at caddis, they have super long antenna on them. And so we had that crystal flash you used for the rib. And this could be an air bubble, or maybe it just adds a little flash to the fly. So let's grab a strand of crystal flash, cut in on top of the hook shank, wrap forward, pull back. And we have a little V, right? And just cover up the loose ends. Even though the antenna are like super long on a caddis. I find a lot of times you do this, if you put them too long, they tend to kind of catch on stuff. So it's taken, hold them together and snip them, maybe two shank lengths, somewhere in there. Now we can do a whip finish. I just use my bare hands. It's not too wintry yet, not super gluing my fingers together yet in Jackson, Wyoming. I'll use a little head cement. I have my uh, disposable bodkin, also known as a toothpick. I have a little nail polish. Are you using Sally Hansen's or what are, what are you using? I'm using Sally Hansen. I mean, wet and wild, any of that stuff will work. Okay. You know, I'm not that particular. Just come to some of the thread, you know, seal the wraps more than anything else, keep it from unraveling. So Scott, do you think there's a, a wet fly? Think? I mean, a pretty versatile little pattern, I says, mostly a swinging fly, but it also works very well as a dead drift damp emerger, you know, especially doing it on a dry fly hook, but it's kind of fun. I mean, it's a really quick fly to tie, it's simple. I says, you can do a streamer with that. You can do an instant D wing with that, with uh, some big feathers if you snip out the center on the wing. Makes a perfect deep wing. There's a one feather wet fly peacock version. It says Titan tan, brown, done, olive done, whatever caddisy colors you like. Pull that one out of the vise. Switch back to my ugly mug. All right, there and alive in the den of death. Fly time material all around, a few wooden bows back here. You know, I got to make up for that catch and release with some catch and disease. I'm going to actually move this camera back here when we get in here too, so you can see my fingers a little bit more. I think it's enough detail. But the PFD uh, parachute came about. I was working on an article for a ma Japanese magazine for tight loops and uh, playing with it around with CDC and foam when foam would kind of first kind of come out. I found if I, we were talking Chernobyl indicators all the time on everything, right? And I found that if I made a little mini Chernobyl indicator and put the CDC in between, it didn't take much CDC to make like a perfect comparison wing. It's like, this is kind of a cool concept. And then I went to the, a little beetle, mega, no, mega beetle, size 10, 12 beetle. And some of the foam flies don't flip over real well. And it's like, wow, I wonder if I just wrap the parachute hackle around the base of the foam and kind of all this stuff kind of bred together. Uh, some of the first of these parachutes I tied like this, I tied it with uh, snowshoe rabbit hair. And they're saying it's super popular fly at the one fly in like a Hecuba color, which is March and March brown or mahogany. And it's caught a hundred fish and still look brand new, but simplifies a few issues that people have with parachutes, uh, building a post, right? And then the other issue that's big time with people is durability. And people work way too hard to make a parachute too durable. I mean, if you're, you gotta make it durable enough to lose. So I'll tie a mahogany done PFD parachute, 
let's hold up the PFD parachute with a little mahogany done, natural on the artificial one. Okay, if you can move the uh, pattern sheet up a little bit, hold it there for a while so people can write down some things. So we can use, I use Cock de Leon, you can use micro fibets for a tail. I mean, your favorite fine dubbing, I use thread for ribs. Uh, depending on size of fly, two millimeter, one and a half, one millimeter foam. And then your polypropylene, Antron, Zeon are pretty much all interchangeable. Could you, you hold, could you you hold like. it up a little higher, Scott? Scott, could you hold it up a little higher? Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, there you go. There you go. Okay, thank you. All right. So let's uh, grab a dry fly hook. Let's grab a, I'm going to adjust the vise and the camera a little bit so you can see my fingers a little bit better. So I may have to refocus. Let's get a hook in here and I can focus on that. Uh, the hook I'm using is a barbless Komodo standard dry fly hook. It's a K100C. I mean, a Chemco 100 type hook would be fine. These are the ones that Yellowstone Fly Company does. Okay, that looks good. good there, guys. Looks good. Great chest there. Get you some blue color. <laughs> It's funny with backgrounds, you know, I'm used to shooting backgrounds of magazine articles with a, you know, piece of paper behind and not my human body. Let's move these materials over. There's always a little stuff. I'm going to get real critical here. There we go. That looks a focus for you guys. That good? It looks good. All right. This will also make me not bump my the uh, camera with my uh, tying hand, so I do my better liver through chemicals. And people ask you, doesn't glue make flies heavy? Not really. Uh, the solvent evaporation of the heavy thing you have on your fly is right there. If you have to make too many thread wraps, I guarantee your fly will sink. So here you can make your base layer of thread. We want a rough texture. And then we're going to do something here and make a dubbing loop. I'm with guys that hate dubbing loops, but I'm not going to use it for dubbing. I'm going to use it for splitting mayfly tails, and I'm also going to use it for a uh, rib. So we got that in there. That's, that doesn't look quite tight in focus. That better? That's, That's better. That's better, yes. Okay. And it's kind of hypercritical to me to find time, too much time with a macro lens. So the next thing we're gonna do is take, oops, I should have done that. Gotta bump that down a little bit. You're gonna need to refocus there. Yeah. There you go. That's yeah, out there. So Scott, what you've done is you've, uh, the tag in of your thread, you made a uh, dubbing loop with that, correct? A dubbing loop with it. And then the critical part here, and don't catch it in your material clip, first thing. You wanna pull one strand to either side of the hook shank. And this will be used for splitting our tails. Let me do a little bit better job on that. You see that? You got one strand on either side. Yeah. will be there. So drop that down. I said you could use some Cock de Leon. You can use microfiber. That's all like the Cock de Leon. Uh, I mean, telling material from a hackle is actually fairly hard to come by. And all these guys like 
Tom Whiting on their dry fly hackle have made too good of dry fly hackle and it's really fine and small. But it's hard to find these long stiff barbs. Although sometimes you find like some old Chinese knacks, which are horrible hackle. Well, I actually have pretty good uh, tailing material. So I break off a bundle of fibers. Uh, I'm gonna do this where you can see it. Got to pull grains, kind of even them out so they look fairly even, and then pull against the grain. That's probably even enough. You guys like Chris Williams, who's just like the nicest Spring Creek tire I know. They'll actually stack these in a hair stacker. Technically, mayflies have two to three tails. I'm not worried. I'm just kind of using this split tail for two reasons. It's realism, right? Mayflies have split tails. The other thing people don't think about is flotation. There's as much metal here as there is here, but there's nothing pointing the back of the hook. So this is going to be the outriggers. And I'm using the inline rotary vise to help design this Montana mongoose. But to be honest with you, if you're tying a bunch of small dry flies, I use my Dyna King or something like that, that you can actually tilt your jaw up higher. will give you more room to work with your fingers. If you do this, it doesn't work real well for filming. I have more finger room to work with, right? And people don't move their vices around enough to make it where it's comfortable for them. I mean, make your vice work for you. Stay on focus for you guys. I'm not gonna twist this thread. And there's the next step, your fingernail or thumbnail. Push down, we're gonna splay the fibers. See if I can do that so you can see it. There you go. And then we're gonna pull the thread and it takes a couple times. And it's like a lot of fly time stuff is easier to do quicker than short than slower. Once you have it separated, pull the thread up through the center and just drop off your bobbin a few times. And if it's not perfectly even, you can slide your scissors in and snip out a few fibers. It says I'm not super worried. And if I want to get real fancy, I could take a drop of glue at the end and make those multiple plicity of uh, fibers into one tail. Scott, could you uh, rotate your fly so we can see it from the top view? Yep. Okay, there you go. Thank you. And once you have it in there, you can kind of manipulate it a little bit, point your thread a little bit more, get more of a splay. That's just pull that back, that'll be a rib. That's like thread ribs. I use a little dry fly dubbing. This is, I think some super fine or something similar. Actually, it's actually UV2, kind of mahogany color. Mahogany's are a nice bug. I mean, pretty common mayfly in the fall. And it's kind of across the country, but you can change the color on this obviously. I'm not going to need a whole lot of dubbing. And a lot of times when I say on dubbing on small flies, what I want to do is just color the thread. You don't need a whole lot. Come back here. Without wax on there, it can slide that little dubbing right up against it, which doesn't matter on the size 14, it does on a 20. Let's dub up about two thirds, three quarters. Couple fibers bother me. Snip them off, don't try to rewrap. Let's take this thread. I'll twist it together again. Now segment of the body. Remember tying off the uh, crystal flash? What do we do? Pull that around the thread. Twist it. Do that again. Twist that around the thread. And it's going to be pretty secure. So next thing I do, I'm just going to add a little micro more dubbing. Because we're going to try a foam Chernobyl indicator on top of this. One thing you'll find with foam or any bulky material is 
if you have material underneath for a base, it doesn't twist as much. You need texture, you need friction. That's your standard two millimeter foam. I'll cut a strip that's probably a third to half of the gap. Get that a little more even. And this will be a base of our parachute. And we're gonna tie it in. I, in flight time, all times I do the waste more want not rather than the vice versa. What's the market value of that piece of foam? About a quarter of a cent. What's the market value of my time? If I get frustrated, I'll come back just a touch. I'm gonna set this down. A good trick for tying with foam with fine thread is take your thumbnail. If you want, pre-crease the foam. Give it a little notch to go into. And with that dubbing underneath, it doesn't take a whole lot to hold it in place. If I was trying to one fly fly at this, I'd be smearing a, a smear of super glue about every step with just a smear. So we got that. Let's grab some poly. Yellow EP. It's like pale pink color is kind of a nice color. It's not too gaudy. And what's kind of interesting with parachutes, if you want visibility, it's got to contrast with the background. Sometimes white parachute, white parachute is the worst thing I can see. I mean, especially like bluing olives in the fall. I mean, it's just the glare is white, you know, evening light's white. But the pale pink, pale orange, I don't think it bothers fish most of the time. And let's tie this poly right in the middle of the foam. That's what, three wraps? Need to pull it over, just take a wiggle it, pull on it. I tied it in extra long. And the reason this foam being extra long, because when we wrap our parachute around the base, stuff's not gonna get in the way. Where's that stupid little hair coming from? There we go. Kind of like my hair, it goes everywhere. And we'll grab a little more buzzard domesticus. Uh, medium to light done hackle works fine on this fly. You know, tying a lot of times it's hackybuzz, which will look like a March brown, which would be tan body, this color thread, grizzly brown. And here again, I'm gonna select the hackle while it's still on the hide. Because if I don't, I'm gonna lose that hackle. A good trick if you take one off, it's about one and a half gaps, right? Let's get one slightly bigger. Is you're gonna lose it, right? That looks about good. If you do cut one off or break it off or like these whiting hackles are so long, put in your hook box with the right size hooks or I just have a little tub full of hackles. Whenever I need to tie something, I can just look in there first. I'm gonna prep the hackle and I'll do this first and then show you. So I pull back the fibers, right? Next, I'm gonna snip the fibers so close to the stem. This gives some of my thread to hold on to. It drives me nuts when I see people that strip the stem. It's really hard to hold in place and it's really hard to angle it the right direction. I'm gonna wrap my hackle counterclockwise other people wrap it clockwise, they both work. My feeling here is they go counterclockwise. I'm wrapping away from me essentially, and my thread's wrapping away from me. So I figure it's a little bit snugger that way. Tie this in in front of the post. And it's kind of angled the direction it's supposed to go, right? If you don't start out the direction you want it to go, it's never gonna be in the right spot. Of course, the one good thing I'll tell you is with, with the, the concave side down is most of genetic hackles anymore is so damn straight that it doesn't matter what direction you wrap it as a parachute, to be honest with you, you can't really see a difference. I'm gonna dub small thorax, basically just cover my thread wraps. 
do a quickie figure eight. And this is why I left that long. If I cut it short, everything's always in the way, right? You may need to pull the hackle out. It's covered up pretty well. Let's wrap the hackle. A couple of things happen with that post, right? Hackle doesn't lift up. It didn't take any effort to build a firm base. And I start up and then start wrapping underneath. You don't need a whole lot of wraps on this. And this is probably the biggest trick with tying off parachutes. There's no way not to trap fibers. Let me tell you, you can't, you won't trap fibers to, to full of it. You trap the least amount of fibers. So what I don't want to do is I don't want to do this, right? And trap a bunch of fibers. So I found works the best. So I grab this with my left hand and just wiggle, 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 wiggle. Point my bobbin. So it goes above the hook eye but below the hackle here, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And what that wiggle does is it gives some of those, those fibers a chance to slip off. That's probably good there. And snip that off there. Pull back, wrap. That stray fiber there is making me mad. Just trim it off. Yep, should tighten the vice more after putting the dry fly hook in. And then I'll just do a quick whip finish. I mean, three or four wraps is fine. And we can adjust everything back up. Use my scissors like a stiletto. Let's pull this back and let's slip the scissors down. Not open, barely open, right? Snip, pull that forward, grab that, slip it down. Don't need, to need much of a button there. Show you what not to do. I get my hook in there, all right. Don't cut flat and even. You know, let's snap it. There we go. It just doesn't look right. I mean, kind of that blonde and a better thing to do is if you twist it and if anybody's tied glow bugs, how you make them round, you just twist it and then you cut it. And it's even, but not too even, if that makes sense. I mean, this looks a little bit more natural to me. You can put a little whip finish on there. I mean, a little cement on the whip finish. There's a view from underneath. Still fairly, that's kind of a hard focus there. You get some fiber to hang down, just lift up. But kind of a cool way to do a parachute. And this is I've literally, we've had kind of 100 fish on these. And if I was tying a one fly fly, I would have actually wrapped down through the hackle and the post like that and reinforced it like that. But great little fly, change the color, change the paint job. Scott, yeah. could you talk a little bit about, you're, you're sort of famous for this one fly contest in tying flies that are winning flies for the one fly. Could you kind of talk a little bit about uh, how do you uh, bomb proof those flies so they last a long time? One of the first things you want to do is take out materials that you know are going to break. I mean, a fly is only as durable as the weak link. So kind of maybe substituting some material, you know, instead of using deer hair, you might use poly because deer hair tends to break down. The other thing is I'll go through and break test hooks. I mean, there's good and bad batches of hooks. I mean, I think probably the strongest hooks that I've found overall have been the, the Daiichis. They may bend easier, but they don't shatter or some of the harder hooks actually will break. The other thing is, judicious use of glue. And it's just like, I use super glue on a lot of steps. I'm putting on with a toothpick and it's a smear. You don't need much at all. You know, put a base there. I would put a, a smear after I split the mayfly tails before I tied in the foam for the parachute. I would put a smear there, put a smear when I tied in the poly. 
And then like say like Chernobyl or foam flies, I put a drop of super glue and then build thread and actually put dubbing over it. You just got to put a firm base on it. And then learning, you know, one of the things at a time, learning how many wraps you need to make it work, but not having to put a whole lot more in there. It takes a little practice. And this is come with different ideas at PFD just made perfect sense. I did other parachutes like that, that I used thread through the wing and stuff, but this little foam base just makes a big difference. And with that foam base, basically the hackle can't lift up. You got a button underneath, right? That's kind of, you know, material selection, judicious use of glue and lots of practice. Okay, I appreciate it. Well, Scott, I really appreciate you tying tonight. And, uh, I think uh, we had about 46 participants, which is pretty right. good right, right before the holiday. And uh, I want to uh, encourage everybody to come back next, next Wednesday. That's uh, November, uh, no, December the 2nd. Uh, Jim Ferguson is going to be tying hair wing salmon flies. Uh, and that's something, if you've never tied a salmon fly, this is your opportunity to to check Jim out. He's a, a real master at salmon flies. So I want to wish everybody a uh, happy Thanksgiving and uh, be safe. We'll see you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.